So we embark on a new journey today. How are you doing, Thomas? I'm very well. Thanks for hosting me. The um, This one is going to be... This one's interesting to me because I was alive <coughs> for part of this and I was sentient for... I mean, I, I remember a lot of this. So um, we had teased about talking about the Cold War. But um, you said that you had a, we're going to start at the end and then go back to the beginning. So um, what do you got? Well, there's a few things here. I want to explain my rationale before we deep dive into it. You know, I don't want to presume the viewers and the listeners have knowledge that they don't. I mean, not, I'm not saying that anybody's not smart or anything, but some of this stuff has become somewhat esoteric. Mm-hmm. It's just because of the way the news cycle doesn't properly provide context to historical events particularly where there's military variables involved and, you know, political narratives become paramount to characterize these things. But also it's just hard to place oneself conceptually in an epoch that has totally passed. You know, uh, I, I went through that when, when, when people like my, my parents, they had to talk about the fifties and sixties and things, you know, I mean, all, all people go through that, but you know, the reason why I indicated, you know, I want to, I'm treating this as kind of the end was the beginning Everything that is happening today in political terms, in, in foreign policy terms, um, in terms of the in terms of the guiding ideology of Washington, and I say ideology, not ideologies plural, because I really do believe that there, there's a true consensus there. there. There's no opposition party in Washington at all. I mean, arguably since 1933, there hasn't been real opposition, but in discrete policy terms, there was. Now that, that no longer exists. There's an absolute quorum. There's one ideology. There's one strategic vision. There's one there's there's one sense of when intervention and force is 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 legitimate, um, and that that is totally ideologically driven. It's, it's not it's not driven by strategic variables of of a realist or, or even a particularly concrete nature. You know, it's very much based on on very abstract things and ideological things. <clears throat> but the only way to understand why that's the case, and the only way to understand why Ukraine is the designated battleground, and the only the only way to understand why Russia, the Russian Federation, as it exists today, has been slated for annihilation, uh, is, is to understand how the Cold War resolved and, and why it resolved the way it did. <clears throat> so to begin, I'm going to go back to the last sort of conflict cycle of the Cold War. Very briefly, to speak on detente, detente was born of two things. For those that don't know, detente was... It was a it was an it was an explicit and series of implicit agreements between the United States and Soviet Union Warsaw Pact to not engage in direct strategic competition. Part of this owed to the fact that uh, America was losing the Cold War militarily, not just in Vietnam, but on secondary battlefronts like Angola. Um, the uh, the Indo-Pakistan War was very much an attempt to uh, owing to the. Uh, Going to the then nascent Sino-Soviet split, um, the, the the Soviets were interested in hedging China with with India. You know, being a huge populous country, um, Pakistan was kind of the American response to that. You know, creating, trying to cultivate Pakistan as a proxy, but these things were not going well. And obviously, direct intervention. There's, there's this weird period between the end of the military draft and you know the 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 kind of full um, development of the all volunteer force and the full development and implementation what's become known as the revolution in military affairs you know they entailed everything from command and control technology to global positioning technology you know to uh to smart munitions becoming the norm rather than the exception okay there's a strange kind of period between those two things where the u.s army was operating on a shoestring budget i mean the whole not just the army the whole military there was no political will in washington for deploy overseas uh, communism in the third world in Europe had become very stagnant, but in the third world, it had this great animating power and there the Soviets were blessed with a great deal of proxies who were already in being, you know, uh, it, 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 in, in cadre with a, a full cadre structure and, you know, men under arms that could facilitate military outcomes, uh, that very much benefited the Soviets. All they really needed was a constant supply of weapons and the Soviets could kind of take a hands-off approach. So from about 1973 onward, you know, this, this kind of, this kind of strategic paradigm reigned. However, during that period, um, uh, the technology that, that 
underpins strategic nuclear weapons dramatically improved. Um, you know, owing to the owing to the early revolution in computing technology, owing to owing to increase improved circular or probable from you know things like the space program, you know, and just owing to uh, owing to real satellite technology. We'll get into that in a minute. What I mean, you know, it it, it it we take for granted that satellite imaging, you know, gives you a real time picture of the battle space, but that was not the case until the late 1970s, practically until 1980. Okay. So uh, this endured until 1979. What happened in 1979? The Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Uh, and that really alarmed people because for reasons we'll get into in a moment beyond the obvious. It was misunderstood why that happened. I know Mr. Trump said it was to fight Islamic terrorism. That doesn't make any sense. Other people claim that, well, it was the Brezhnev Doctrine. You know, that being that the Soviet Union declared that it would intervene on behalf of the socialist community of nations to preserve socialism. Okay, that was the rationale, the pretext. What it really was, was that outside of Moscow, the primary command and control hub for Soviet strategic nuclear forces was in Kazakhstan, or uh, was, uh, yeah, it was in Kazakhstan, okay? Um, and that's why, not accidentally, that's where Star City is, you know, where, where the Soviet Union and later the Russian Federation, you know, launched their space vehicles from. So if Afghanistan could be flipped or could have been flipped and transformed into a Western client state with basing rights there, uh, the Soviets have been looking at a situation where their, their, their strategic nuclear command and control could be decapitated, you know, at least a substantial portion of it. And that was not acceptable. Now, in Dropov, even though Brezhnev was at the helm, and Dropov was really kind of the, 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 the shadow executive of the Soviet Union. You know, the Soviet political structure was very Byzantine, not just because the party and the state were, 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 were interstitially combined with one another, but because who was, the, who was the true executive, you know, varied. You know, generally it was a man who had a combination of offices, you know, like um, the, uh, he often would be a man who held both the premiership and the general secretary of the communist party. Um, other times it was, it was, it was far more uh, opaque. And uh, and drop off reigned formally as uh, as, as 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 you know the the general secretary from eighty two to eighty four. But I'd argue that probably from about nineteen sixty nine, he was a true shadow executive of the Soviet Union, and he was a very brilliant guy. And the world as it's structured today, and the fate of the Soviet Union, and decisions made therein, for better and ill, owe very much to Mister Andropov. But it was his decision to invade Afghanistan. And he was looking many steps ahead in terms of, you know, the implications for the strategic nuclear balance and uh, the ability of the, of the Soviet Union to survive a bolt from the blue nuclear assault, which was a real concern for reasons we'll get into. And it's, um, it's difficult to emphasize how dangerous it was to have two superpowers fully mobilized with massive nuclear arsenals on hair trigger alert at all time when the technological curve was really moving towards removing human decision makers from the equation you know only to the only to with the narrowing temporal window of decision making in the event of nuclear war this is really becoming out of it was really kind of becoming removed from human hands you know technology has its own momentum and societies at scale we're talking about literally hundreds of millions of people and, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of aggregate decisions, you know, control, controlling the trajectory of that massive state. Um, you know, the, these the, these things can't just e easily be moved one way or the other. And, and the proverbial brakes can't just be put on an apparatus of that scope, scale, and complexity. You know, like, I, you, I'm not trying to be esoteric. I mean, this is, this is fundamental to understanding you, the paradigm. Do it, you think um, they... Go ahead. Let me ask. Can I, let me, do you think that they did that because of, um, you know, Daniel Ellsberg put out the doomsday machine, which really shined a light on what he saw in the nuclear policy? What was the way in the late 50s, early 60s, how the how nukes were being overseen? Do you think that that because of the way that could have turned into a disaster they possibly thought that well if we turn this over into 
um, more of a even starting to talk about AI and things like that, it would be better oh, than having yeah. humans handle this. Definitely. And the, the progenitor, like the, the proverbial father of AI is nu strategic nuclear war planning. The idea was this, okay, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead because you asked, I, I want to kind of deal with this now. By the 1980s, you know, where, where true parity existed between the superpowers in terms of strategic nuclear forces and being as well as capabilities. A, uh, a bolt from the blue strike, uh, if launched by hypersonic cruise missiles from Europe against the Soviet Union, they would have as little as five minutes to render a decision on retaliation. The United States would have longer, but we're talking about eight to 15 minutes in the case of the United States. Um, I'm not going to bore people with the details of how that would have played out. It would have involved things like an SLBM uh, assault launched at the depressed trajectory, the spoof early warning systems, detonating a, a ground burst detonation, thus an EMP would knock out remaining early warning. But the point is, like, imagine the situation where, okay, you know, if, 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 if policy is to, you know, even a policy is to launch on warning, not launch on confirmation of assault. It's like, okay, it's two in the morning, you know, American time or, or in Moscow. You wake up the, the wake up the president of the United States or you wake up uh, the general secretary. You know, you say, Mr. President, you know, we, we just received like confirmation, like incoming assault. He's got eight minutes to decide like how he's going to retaliate if he's going to retaliate, what that retaliation is going to entail, what forces are going to be availed to it, whether it's going to be counter, counter force, but not counter value, whether it's going to be, you know, full spectrum attack. That it's We're at the point where there's two totally academics that's not possible, okay? So the idea was you've got to be able to discern absolute indicators before, you know, not, not just before launch detection, but before even what's considered early warning detection. And if you could code those indicators into, into variables that could be rendered as inputs, then your AI could tell you when you're facing imminent assault. But the problem with that is, like, when do you decide when do you decide to to launch? Is that when there's a, over a 50% probability of imminent attack? When, when it's 80%? When it's anything over 10%? You know, when it's 5%? You know, these deeper parodies make this incredibly difficult. But regardless, there was a secondary issue too, and I'm going to get into this now because this is a perfect kind of way to kind of slide into it. As detente ended, Carter, who gets a bad rap, and now don't get me wrong, Carter was not a good president, but he was not a terrible man. He was actually a very moral man, and he did some good things. One of the good things he did was in 1979, uh, Carter, uh, Carter tapped William Odom, who was a general, a very brilliant guy. He, Odom was rare because he kind of had the, the logistical brilliance of, uh, of Omar Bradley, but he was also a real warrior. You know, he was like a, he was like a soldier's general. He understood combat. He really understood nuclear weapons. Okay. I, I think he's kind of a counterpart. His historical counterpart would be somebody like Blackjack Pershing. But William Odom went through, uh, the presidential decision-making handbook and literally such a thing existed for, for nuclear war. And it was incredibly opaque. It was incredibly obtuse. It was not up to speed in terms of the technology of the day. And it didn't give the president any real ability to, to, uh, it, it didn't give him any liberty of action respect to the war plan. Now, part of that's because this was drafted in literally 1965. So basically what it entailed, it, and, and, and the core of this of this presidential handbook was the was the PSYOP, not the psychological operation, the SIOP, the single integrated operational plan. To this day, there's an SIOP, but it is totally different. And it's changed many times. But as of 1979, um, it was this arcane document that was no longer relevant and it basically gave the president a handful of menu options it was literally listed as, as response menu it was counter value and counter uh force assault against uh the soviet union all uh warsaw pact states where strategic nuclear forces are based 
and the same for the People's Republic of China. There's another menu option that was the same thing for China, but not the USSR and Warsaw Pact. There's another menu option that was the reverse. There's another one that was just strictly counter, strictly counter for us, no counter value. A lot of this came from the fact that we were talking about a moment ago about satellites. Okay. Until about 1980, or like 1978, 1980, U.S. satellites that would uh, that would provide data on uh, the basing location of enemy forces, they were always several weeks out of date because these satellites would take their pictures. Uh, the f- little film would be deposited in a canister. The canister would fall to Earth and be recovered from the ocean. It would be retrieved, developed, then analyzed. So sometimes they're talking about months out of date information. And one of the things the Soviets did, which was kind of cunning in its simplicity, rather than availing uh, their land-based ICBMs to, and to the super hardened structures, uh, they, they put them on trucks and mobile launch vehicles. Like everybody's seen the footage. I mean, at least if you were a kid, like when I was, you know, there'd be these ominous as hell, uh, uh, there'd be this ominous little footage from the Moscow military parades or these SS-19, these huge ICBMs on, on these trucks, you know, literally. Okay, they were, they'd move them around every single day, you know, uh, and that, to spoof, uh, to spoof enemy targeting. Um, and this led to totally crazy stuff. Like, by the, by the mid-80s, NSA satellites and DI satellites, they were photographing the soil in the Soviet Union and East Germany, uh, to detect tracks from these vehicles, because based on the depth, you could tell if the payload was so you know was something of the weight of an SS nineteen or not. Like it's totally insane. Like not insane as in stupid or bad. Like but like totally insane. Like the amount of work and and, and like man hours that went into this. You know, uh, people can't even conceive of something like that today. But so what Carter and Odom decided was there was another thing too that was disturbing about the SIOP and the entire the entire response uh, plan. It was that by the time, by the state of technology of 1979, it, it was just accepted that in the event of a bolt from the blue assault or, uh, or an unforeseen escalation of, of conventional war, wherein, you know, the enemy, uh, the, the enemy just, you know, goes all in, you know, escalates to the counter value nuclear assault. It was just accepted that the president would be dead. And, all civilian decision makers would be dead. So the only people who would be able to manage the response would be strategic air command based as they were in super hardened places like Cheyenne mountain, as well as in the looking glass aircraft. That was the airborne command post. That's really disturbing. It's also damn unconstitutional. You can't craft a war plan and be within article two parameters that says, well, the president's going to die. So, you know, General Powers or General LeMay or, or General so-and-so, he's not the de facto president. You know, he's he, he's, he's Lord High Executioner and that he's totally in control of the of strategic nuclear forces, but also he's just like the reigning like government official who's going to survive. So it all comes down to him. Uh, that's a very dangerous situation, among other things. And also, like I said, it's patently unconstitutional. Carter said that's unacceptable. So what Carter did was he ordered Odom to draft uh, a... Uh, a, uh, a comprehensive uh, response uh, plan, basically bring the SIOP up to speed, account for deeper parodies, account for up to the moment intelligence that could be gleaned from, you know, the then contemporary satellite systems that would allow for, uh, you know, instantaneous retargeting as needed and things like this. Carter demanded that there be, uh, that part of this plan include designated civilian national command authorities. You know, basically the president and his cabinet would all be issued these ID cards that all had a code, okay? And the code would constantly change. But uh, these men and a handful of women were in the cabinet, the executive cabinet. They'd have to, every day, they'd have to report on their whereabouts. And if they left the uh, District of Columbia, they have to report like every hour as to where they were. So they had, and uh, there was a series of military bases and hardened structures that they would be designated to travel to wherever they were in event of war. So basically, long story short, a system was put into place. This was not completed until about 1945, but a system was in place wherein there was no way that every civilian national command authority would be killed. Okay, there would always be someone who could manage the war on behalf of the executive and the civilian leadership. Okay, Um, there was other things, too. 
But what this basically what this all came down to taken together, this meant that um, owing to the technology of the time and the kind of the evolving state of warfare, command and control, uh, smart munitions, everything else, it, it began. It, America was 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 planning to in event a nuclear war to fight and win a nuclear war. <clears throat> this caused all kinds of consternation from people who didn't really understand deeper parodies, even some people who should have. You know, people had this ongoing kind of delusion that MED MAD was one part kind of talking point, one part kind of in joke of within the nuclear fraternity in the earliest days. Mutually assured destruction does not literally mean the end of everything. Assured destruction is a victory metric in strategic nuclear warfare. It's the point at which an enemy society can no longer reconstitute the wage war. It's basically the point, the attrition point at which you kill an enemy society, which is a horrific metric because in the case of the Soviet Union or America as in the 1970s, that entailed about 70 or 80 million people. Okay. But this idea that the only reason nuclear weapons exist is to make sure they are never used like that, that's an absurdity. And it's also, it just wasn't by the 1970s, the end of the 1970s, you had, uh, you had uh, multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles. You had decoys. You had ways to spoof early warning radar. You had hypersonic missile platforms that that uh, that 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 wouldn't, you know, that, that didn't that didn't even travel on ballistic trajectory. Like it was totally obsolescent. And uh, as William Odom said, he said, "Look," uh, he said at the time, and he re- he re- reiterated later to one of his biographers. He's like. I had an obligation that if America was attacked with nuclear weapons, I had an obligation, you know, in, in concert with the president to fight and win a nuclear war. And he's absolutely right. Um, with the other kind of perverse feature of MAD and that kind of whole ethos, it's like I'm obligated to commit suicide. And so it was like, you know, 80 million other people because, oh, we failed in our effort to maintain peace to the balance of terror. Like it's there's something crazy about it. But that's uh, that's basically what ushered in the final phase of the Cold War. Now, I want to fast forward a bit to uh, what exactly happened when uh, it became clear that not just cracks in the edifice of the Soviet Empire were emerging, but that there was a genuine um, structural crisis underway. And part of how this developed owes the personalities, quite literally, of George Herbert Walker Bush and Mikhail Gorbachev. Now, Mr. Bush, I've got to drop some biographical background on Bush for this to make any sense. I'm not trying to bore anybody. Bush was a very dynamic guy, frankly, and he's not a well-loved individual, and that's fine. I'm not. I'm not saying people should like Bush like morally or, or think that you know he was like a good man or something, but. He had an incredibly in-depth understanding of the nuances of the strategic balance under the Cold War. But he was head of the CIA in 1974 when something very controversial happened. See, um, the uh, as, I, as I made the point before in a very different context, the CIA really lost its cachet in the 60s. And subsequently with the Gates hearings, and it, it wasn't just that people were morally outraged by things like the Phoenix program, which they put squarely on the shoulders of CIA and when really kind of responsibility, if you want to look at it that way, if you view this as a grave evil, kind of rested equally with Army Intelligence, McAfee SOG, the Pentagon itself. But, you know, one of the reasons it's misplaced and people act like CIA is kind of the the seat of, of, the, of deep state power. It's really not. And... um it was really, really loathed by a lot of very hawkish cold warriors. So something happened in 1974. Um, there's something to this day that is that is corralled by uh, the intelligence services called the National Intelligence Estimate. It, it's it's become kind of meaningless now because intelligence and the whole, the whole intelligence game is totally different today. Um, and we could do an episode on that if, if anybody's interested, but I, I'm not going to deep dive into that because that's just too much kind of collateral stuff. But the uh, it was the belief of uh, 
everybody from, you know, kind of hawkish senators and congressmen, you know, to Pentagon types, to guys in army intelligence, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to Ronald Reagan himself, who, you know, as early as, as, as the mid seventies, you know, had his eyes on a white house bid, you know, the believers that the CIA was not feeding, they were not feeding good data to, uh, to those to whom they were accountable, civilian or military. The claim was that they were consistently underestimating Soviet capabilities, as well as just kind of internal dynamics from the so within the Soviet Union relating to the leadership cast, as well as relating to probable decisions that the Soviets would make and when confronted with with with, with crises, with crises both within and without their sphere of influence. So it was proposed that what was called Team B be corralled as a competitive analysis exercise. Now, what was the mandate of quote unquote Team B? Uh, there, it was commissioned to aggregate and analyze data from diverse sources, basically any available intelligence sources that were then relied upon, okay, um, to judge the accuracy, comprehensiveness, the predictive value of the national intelligence estimate of the preceding several years, okay. Now, the folks at Team B. It, it was 16 experts total, and I'll, I'll get into who those men were in just a minute. They were divided into three teams, okay, or, or yeah, teams or classes, if you will. One of them was to study specifically low altitude Soviet air defense capabilities, which, again, I don't want to bore anybody, but this relates to things, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 stealth technology didn't exist yet, but it was understood that this was in the wings, and even were it not. Uh, platforms like the like what became the B-1 bomber. Uh, you know, the idea was if you could fly below conventional radar um, and strike super hardened targets with uh, with very, very heavy uh, nuclear weapons, uh, you know, you, 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 that's the most effective way to knock knock out uh, these counterforce targets. So even even though it seems like overly specific and esoteric, I mean, that's that's why this was such an such a priority. OK. So, the study of low effectiveness and capabilities of, of low altitude, specifically low altitude Soviet air defense capabilities in places like Moscow, in places like Kazakhstan. Okay. Another team was a study of the accuracy of land based Soviet and Warsaw Pact ICBMs. Okay. Um, the circular error probable. Traditionally, the Soviets uh, larded their, their launch vehicles with warheads that had absolutely massive throw weight. So, even if they lost a substantial amount of them, you know, it's a, uh, to ABM technology, those that hit would, would, would be absolutely devastating. That's kind of how they resolved the, you know, the issue. I mean, America had a very different, America's ethos was kind of the opposite. America's idea was eventually, you know, to create basically smart munitions uh, on strategic play in, in, in the strategic arsenal and pepper the target area with, with sub megaton, warheads which, which is far far more devastating than one massive uh uh device for reasons i don't fully understand but i'm sure physics guys could like shed some light on and finally and most importantly the third you know team within team b their role was to study soviet st strategic priorities and how this interface with policy orientation basically what's the soviet What's the Soviet? What's the Soviet doctrine on nuclear war? Like, when would they truly escalate? And beyond that, in more, in, in more kind of global, figuratively and literal terms, like, what is their grand strategy? Like, how does the Soviet Union aim to increase its power in this kind of uncertain epoch that we're entering? Um, now, who was on this team? And you're going to you're going to understand why I made a big deal about Bush and uh, and. Uh, like Bush the man his personality. This team was headed by Richard Pipes. Uh, it included uh, Daniel Graham, uh, William Van Cleve, uh, Foy D. Kohler, Seymour Weiss, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, and Paul Nitz, who'd been the creator of the Committee on the Present Danger in 1950, which over, over time had various iterations, all of which basically, it's, it's, it's not really relevant now, but that was always kind of the... Uh, that, that was always that was, that was kind of the, that was called the political action committee of Cold War Hawks. Okay, 
Now, if you know it's from that list I just ticked off, these are like the fathers of neoconservatism, not philosophically, but in policy terms. That is not an accident, okay? And these guys basically were saying, well, Bush's CIA is totally incompetent, and they do not know what they're doing, okay? Um, and uh, thus, when uh, Bush was uh, brought on board as Reagan's VP, Reagan was surrounded with neoconservatives as advisors. And I would go as far as to argue people like Oliver North, people like Poindexter, um, people like Al Haig, who didn't last long, admittedly. These guys were ultra hawkish, but they were not neocons. However, neocons very much had Reagan's ear. And Reagan himself was something of a neocon, okay? He was a, he was a Roosevelt New Dealer who, you know, had a kind of Saul on the road to Damascus moment. Um in the, uh, in the post-war years. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's a whole nother issue, but so Bush was basically the company man who was Reagan's price admission to the white house and Bush and Reagan did not particularly like each other. And, uh, when Bush found himself elected president, um, he was surrounded by men, uh, who had, uh, gone on to very storied and powerful roles in a uh, policy planning corridors and the national security apparatus uh, who, who, who were very, very hostile to, to his worldview and who did not view him as particularly competent. Okay. Um, Bush tried to insulate himself with, with, with his own loyalists. And I think he did that in large measure, you know, people like Baker or people like Scowcroft, who's kind of a complicated figure in terms of his values. He had neoconish tendencies, but first and foremost, he was loyal to Bush. Um, and uh, when Bush took office, you know, uh, February 1989, again, not only was this kind of Team B faction that would much later become kind of known to the public as, you know, the neocon cabal, some aspect of it, at least, uh, not only were they insinuated very much into the, into the national security apparatus, but, you know, certain expectations have been raised by Reagan. Um, you know, Reagan and Gorbachev uh, had this tremendous rapport, um, and that was legit. That was that was real. That wasn't. Bad. Bush found the speed of things very alarming. A few months before Bush took uh, before inauguration day, Bush actually tapped Henry Kissinger, um, and he asked him to contact Gorbachev as an intermediary. Kissinger secretly traveled to Moscow um, and he met with Gorbachev and Kissinger explained as ordered that there would not be a seamless transition of administrations from Reagan to Bush. And when Gorbachev, Gorbachev was kind of put out by this as well as taken aback, you know, and Gorbachev said, well, why? What Kissinger articulated was exactly what Bush instructed him to. He said, look, there's a danger here of a structural and political nature. You know, a reckless U.S. president could totally derail the transition away from communism. You know, there could be a coup of hardliners, which there was, and we'll get into that, but that was not until what it appeared. Uh, there could be uh, there could be open civil war between the nationalities, and that did happen in some theaters. Uh, there could be uh, a complete uh, Weimar-style collapse, which also did happen to some degree. Um, what Kissinger relayed in essence was Bush had told him, you know, an American president could do much to derail the transition away from communism, but could do little to grease the skids, uh, to fil facilitate the process more rapidly. Now to understand what Bush's vision was, it was a lot like Nixon's after Nixon left office. Now, as you probably remember, it's about my age, Pete, Nixon kind of got a second lease on life. By the by, the mid late mid to late 1980s, he wrote some very good books on uh, the strategic situation. He wrote a lot about the Cold War, which frankly was Nixon's like raison d'être. Um, and it, you know, and even he, he was even tapped by CNN during the Gulf War, like not infrequently, shortly before he died. But Nixon and Bush, their idea was this: their idea was that. We can preserve the Soviet Union as some kind of benign structure, at least for the time being. You know, what, what has to be paramount is total nuclear disarmament and uh, and then gradual 
uh, demobilization of conventional forces until such that they're drawn down to basically nothing more than a, the kind of Weimar style, you know, constabulary force to manage internal strife, you know, or ethnic conflict or things like this. Um, in Bush's case, it was very much a kind of, it was very much kind of the vision of Roosevelt that, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union would kind of govern the planet literally with, you know, Moscow as the junior partner, but that, you know, this massively federated structure that took up literally one sixth of the earth should remain intact the alternative is just too unpredictable and uh it seems unrealistic to us i mean regard regardless of the, the the merit of such things on their own terms or such concepts you whether how utopian they are there's a singular fixation among policy planners after nuremberg of at all costs is preventing armed conflict and if you look at government as some kind of progressive instrumentality in lieu, in lieu of looking at it as, as either a necessary evil or as a means by which, you know, the posterity and historical mission of a people is preserved, you kind of view this as the zenith of government. So the Bush faction, if you want to call it that, contra the, the neocon or proto-neocon faction, this was their vision, okay? In contrast, the guys who had staffed Team B and who had now become these kind of uber hawks insinuated into various roles, they viewed the Soviet Union as quite literally evil. They, like that was not hyperbole. That, that's the way they looked at it. Some of this was ethno, some of this was ethno sectarian, owing to the background of a lot of these men. Some of it was was not. It was just you know guys who were not of that particular background, but who who just viewed it as evil incarnate. So their idea was it had to be destroyed. Now, you know, if we destroy the Soviet Union by open warfare, so be it, if that's what, you know, God or or uh, or, or, or Fortuna or whatever in, in ordains, or if we destroy it, you know, by, by dismantling it through, you know, a detonation strategy of, you know, stirring up the nationalities against, against, against mother Russia and against each other. You know, uh, if, if we, if we destroy it by, you know, imposing a kind of looting operation on it, that, that strips of its natural wealth, strips it of its natural resources and national wealth and control of such uh, commodities therein. You know, we, we can just render it prostrate and impotent. That was the competing viewpoint, and this is not hyperbole. These these people spoke very openly of this. Dick Cheney uh, went on record as saying, quite literally, "quote Fuck them, they lost." When confronted with you know the kind of Bush Baker vision. Which seems incredibly reckless regardless of your politics. But um this uh this had the uh this is the effect of really kind of really kind of driving a wedge between uh, Bush and Gorbachev. And this this was uh this was exacerbated because one of uh one of one of Bush's first acts as president He visited Poland, you know, and Poland was kind of ground zero of, of anti-Soviet, not just anti-Soviet sentiment, but of organized resistance, you know, like Valencia and the, the solidarity movement. Bush did not like Valencia. It's, I think part of that was kind of inherent snobbery because Valencia was very much a proletarian. I think Bush viewed him as a rabble rouser. What Bush did was he met with General Gerald Zelsky. And again, if I'm butchering these names, I apologize. I'm very bad with that. I don't like any, any Slavic guys or girls uh, listening, like don't hesitate to correct me in the comments or whatever, but I, I'm not good with these pronunciations. But Charles Elsky was an interesting guy. Uh, he was the only military man who was a chief of state of a Warsaw Pact state, which is interesting to me at least, because tone deaf as the Soviets were, like as bad as their optics were, uh, they realized in some basic way that they couldn't just install, you know, these like military uh, strongmen in, in the several satellite states. But Poland, uh, that's, I mean, Poland was under martial law from, from 1980, 81 onward. But Gerald Zelski was a tragic guy. You know, he, he looked ominous because he was always in uniform and he'd wear these really dark sunglasses. Gerald Zelski's eyes were ruined by snow blindness. He was a he was a Polish and he was he was he was a Polish uh, national of noble birth when the Soviets invaded Eastern Poland in 1939. <sighs> Owing to his parentage and and pedigree, he was sent to a gulag, 
and uh, spent years in hard labor. And uh, the glare off the snow ruined his eyes. Um, but he, you know, it's telling too that he was that the Soviets had to rely on him. You know, there there, 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 there were no there were no dedicated Polish communists. You know, it was it was more of a the the the, the Pol- communist Poland was more of a contrivance even than the DDR or any or anything else within the Warsaw Pact structure, which is interesting. But Bush and Gerald Zelsky had a certain rapport, and Bush went as far as to convince Gerald Zelsky to stand for president when uh, when Poland uh, had their first multi-party election. And Bush was criticized roundly and uniformly for that, but uh, his notion was uh, that, you know, Gerald Zelsky wants uh, the once the once Moscow's boot is no longer on the neck of the Polish nation, figuratively and literally, a man like Gerald Zelsky can really rise to the occasion. And I understand that, even if that's not realistic in context. But this was Bush's notion, okay? And in Bush's defense, what he said later in his own words were uh he wasn't going to go to he wasn't going to visit the Eastern Bloc and go around thumping his chest and 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 trying to stick it to the Soviets that their system was crumbling. And he also would loom really large over U.S. policy. You know, in 1953, in 1956, in 1968, the Soviets uh, these were Tiananmen Square level uh, interventions or and crackdowns on the people uh, first in. East Germany, then in Hungary, then Czechoslovakia. Uh, there was an understanding among, uh, among, in, in not just Bush, but among you know people on kind of both sides of the divide in terms of how to proceed with the situation developing in the East. That if we push this too hard or get too greedy in terms of demanding results and demanding too much too soon, you know, we we may we may see you know some kind of we may see some kind of Stalinist backlash and and uh, a full scale invasion of Poland, and, and 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 it would be a massacre. So I'm not I'm not sitting here saying again that people should like Bush 41 or should like share that view, but I'm just trying to give a balanced perspective. And it was his view was not born of some kind of simpleton's delusion, even if it was not realistic. But what uh, what ultimately did happen was a uh, was very interesting and really conspiratorial kind of figuratively and literally and again we, we're kind of going to come back to the cia and its incompetence and i know people think i overstate this but consider this william crow he was another general who was kind of he would have been considered something like a minister without portfolio had he served a european government but he was close to bush 41 and Baker and Skullcroft and that whole coterie. He said the CIA, literally in mid 1989, he said they were still they were still issuing dispatches that spoke about the USSR as if it was 20 years earlier. They were claiming that Gorbachev was simply abiding the Brezhnev doctrine, but you know he was reluctant to deploy force because he was trying to lull the West into a false sense of security. It's like they were. In, 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 in Crow's words, he said, it's as if the CIA didn't ever see the news. He said it was as if, like, they'd take just kind of official dispatches from East Berlin or Moscow, kind of knock a percentage off of the credibility, but then release that as basically, you know, fact. You know, oh, the East Berlin says that, you know, the that the regime is stronger than ever. That must be true. Or, you know, the like, like Gorbachev's the general secretary, and he says there's going to be no, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to drop the plan economy and the Soviet Union will remain. So that's, that's just a fact. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not using hyperbole that this, this was literally what they were saying. And I mean that anybody, again, who thinks the CIA is like the seat of, of shadow government or the intelligence community is, is, is got to consider that. Um, Defense intelligence really, I mean, not forgive the tangent, but but defense intelligence, the DIA, they really, they really kind of became the guts of U.S. intelligence in a basic way. Okay, them, the NSA, and you know, uh, a, a, a lot of quasi-private uh, entities that you know are contracted and things like that. But uh, the, uh, as everybody knows, uh, the great foil to, Gorb- to Gorbachev is Yeltsin. 
But Yeltsin's ascendancy, Yeltsin was not this kind of great democratizer. I mean, he he's viewed that way because, uh, you know, he uh, he was kind of the king of the uh, referendum. But, uh, you know, it's not, people have this idea, I think, because it's Byzantine, literally, but also like memories are short. I mean, including my own. I'm not saying I'm like above this or something. People seem to remember this as, you know, there was a, you know, the Soviet Union finally held elections. Yeltsin beat Gorbachev. And then there was some kind of referendum to dismantle the Soviet Union. Like, that's not what happened. When Yeltsin seized the uh, power, it's when Gorbachev was, you know, kidnapped by the coup plotters. Yeltsin proceeded to raise to the Russian White House, declare himself for all practical purposes, president of the Russian Federation. Upon ascending to that role, and I mean, there was a referendum insinuating him into that role. He declared the Soviet Union to be abolished. So the offices Gorbachev held as a general secretary of the Communist Party ceased to hold any meaning because the, the entity that Gorbachev held that office in was, was abolished by diktat, which is very strange. Now, who are Yeltsin's backers? It was a combination of kind of radical reformers, you know, these uh these kind of uh this kind of wild west uh capitalist types who kind of saw the looming anarchy as a as, as opportunity for great profit potential. Um, but it was also a lot of Stalinist hardliners who uh, hated Gorbachev. Now, why did they back Yeltsin? I mean, the, the kind of conventional wisdom as well, they just wanted power in the new regime. I don't know if it's that simple, man. I think some of them thought that Yeltsin would rip Gorbachev. Yeah, they'd have to settle for a rump state of just, you know, Russia, basically. But I think they thought that Yeltsin was just going to return things to the status quo after that. But then he didn't. And why didn't he do that? Uh, I think he was basically bought off by, you know, Team B neocon faction, like figuratively and literally bought off. I can't prove that with receipts, but I, I've i thought about this a lot. I've studied a lot and I've read a lot of direct testimony in the in the epoch i i think that's what happened now also you know putin became yeltsin's successor i mean putin had a variety of roles like some some more prestigious than others and at certain junctures he was sidelined i mean never in 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 some disgraceful way but the fact that putin himself uh i mean putin is not some hardliner but he is a product of the old system Okay, if Yeltsin really was this kind of arch liberal, I'm using it in, in, in these terms, in the terms the regime employs them. I don't mean that he, that's what he actually is, but if, if Yeltsin's kind of this arch capitalist reformer, you know, neoliberal ideologue, like he would not have had men like Putin in, in his orbit. He just would not have. He would have had him take. He would not have had him taken up a shot or something. But these guys would have been pensioned off and 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 sent far away from from Moscow. Figuratively and literally. But again, I'm not, I don't speak Russian or read it. And I'm not some kind of expert on the Russian people, their culture or the Soviet Union. But I am convinced that that's what, that's what happened. Um, it, uh, there's also something that people got to consider. The other kind of factor or constellation of factors that rooked Bush's vision. And uh, I don't want to go off track because this is its own topic that's very, very dense. But, you know, the casting of Slobodan Milosevic as this mass murdering nationalist uh, extremist, he was the State Department's guy. And he was the guy who was viewed as the moderate they could work with by Washington. And Bush very much wanted to keep Yugoslavia together. What happened was Helmut Kohl, who I think was about as as, as nationalist as, as any as any uh, chance of the Buddhist Republic could be or can be. When uh, Tujman's Croatia declared independence, Kohl recognized them immediately, and then the die was cast. There was going to be war in the Balkans, and that was key to forming contemporary identities. That's why, in uh, in a very proximate way, not indirectly. 
the Slavic Orthodox identity became paramount again. That's why Bosniaks became very Muslim again. Uh, there was a whole lot of uh, a national socialist and claimed German guys who, like Ingo Hasselbach, uh, he, was, he was not an attractive guy, but he was a skinhead and he was a, he was very involved in 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 the in the right wing in 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 the DDR. You know, he and his people recruited a bunch of Germans to go fight for Croatia. And this was very real. This was not some this was not some Ukraine kind of situation of guys, you know, kind of pretending to be things they're not and, and strange kind of propaganda doesn't really make sense. Like this this really was uh, a kind of a, a kind of return to 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 Europe's identitarian status quo. Now in the wake of this, uh you know, obviously the view that run out was not that won out was not the Bush 41 view. And, you know, the what was also, in my opinion, kind of the Nixon view, although he and Bush parted ways on key issues. What won out was the neocon view, literally. And what you're seeing in Ukraine is the culmination of this kind of 30 year effort of the detonation strategy of radicalizing the nationalities. Like that's what it is. It also has to do with preventing Europe from, uh, from, uh, you know, becoming at all autonomous because, uh, a Russian, uh, German Concord is, is really what is the path of superpowerdom. Okay. But, and I mean, don't get me wrong. There's many, many guys in Washington who don't care about Ukraine or Russia. And that's their notion. However, the faction we're talking about, they very, very much have an ancestral hatred of Russia and they very, very much abide this idea that, you know, the structure's rotten, it should be destroyed. Uh, if we can utilize Ukraine as a kind of torpedo, uh, so be it. You know, if we can, um, any way we can, uh, any way we can, we can facilitate the real detonation on, on the frontier, uh, we want to do it. Uh, it's really that simple. Um, but that's, I know it seems like I jumped around a lot, but these are the key developments to understanding what happened. And like I said, next time we'll we'll start out with the Berlin airlift. I think that's a good starting point because as, I, I consider that to be the start of the Cold War. Okay, and from there we'll go in like linear terms. But I thought that this was important. I hope I didn't bore anybody or put anybody off by doing it that way. But that's uh, that's I think where I'll stop for now. Um, well. Let, let me let me ask you a question. And yeah, you'll keep go. You'll keep going a little bit. Um, what would have happened if Dukakis would have got elected in nineteen eighty eight? That's a very interesting question, and it's interesting you raise that because the other day on Twitter, I was talking to some of the fellows um, about the fact that there was an actual policy divide, like a real cleft, you know, between uh, national security hawks and and people who thought the talk could be preserved. Dukakis was definitely from that latter tendency, and that was held against him. You know, there's that famous people. People think Dukakis was kind of Howard Dean scream scream moment is when he was riding in that tank, like looking like an idiot with like a helmet on, like the wrong way. You know, he looks like Snoopy. Like, he look, yeah, he yeah, looks like, like Snoopy. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but I, I actually think Snoopy's kind of a badass though. Like Snoopy fights the Red Baron. Like uh, yeah, yeah. Girl. Dukakis just looked like a fucking jag off, but. <laughs> yeah, but he looked, and it, I mean, if it, it, even if Dukakis had been more of kind of a, a, a like a like a manly like photogenic guy, it, it was so it was so contrived. It's him trying to look like, yeah, I'm tough on defense. Look at me in this tank, you know, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, the hell with Ivan. But it's uh, but uh, Dukakis cabinet. Um, I mean, I, I think Dukakis was uh, I, I think Dukakis was uh, was a tackling dummy. He was I, I, it was a foregone conclusion that that people wanted another Reagan term, and they weren't going to get that obviously. And Bush was the closest thing. And even though Bush was very very at odds with Reagan, people associated them. I mean, just I mean, you know how voters are, especially in those days. Yeah, of course. But yeah, I was uh, one of them. Yeah. Any any. Even a guy like Mondale, kind of an old, kind of an old line, more run of the mill Democrat, because Dukakis was kind of a weird nominee, you know. He was like, like I'm not being crass, but he was, he was like this ethnic politician, frankly. Yeah. Even a more traditional uh, kind of Democrat, he would have had real problems, <coughs> uh, especially if he had a hostile Congress. But it's also the uh, I do believe, uh, and Bush made this point too. I mean, despite everything I just said about Bush's 
Bush very, very, very much believed in negotiating the end of the Soviet negotiating with the Soviet Union that ended from a position of very, very profound strength. Okay, and I think that was essential. I think I think an overly conciliatory uh, executive who'd approach the Soviet, who'd approach kind of the failing Soviet Union as, hey, we we want to reestablish detente. That could have been a game changer, maybe. One thing the team B uh, Co- coterie was right about, if they were right about anything, uh, I think Wolfowitz himself, I think, is the source of this, and I, I agree with it. And I have nothing to say about Wolfowitz at all. He said that Soviet Union by 1974, 75, outside of the third world, nobody had any respect for Marxist Leninism. People in the Soviet Union, their quality of life was better than the third world, but not by a hell of a lot. Uh, nobody believed that, you know, the Soviet Union was leading the world in the sciences or something. All the Soviet Union had was arguably the world's mightiest military, arguably the mightiest army that ever existed. If the only thing, the only thing making you a superpower is your military and the fact you've got 8,000 uh, nuclear weapons, that changes things. That means power projection becomes be, be, becomes overvalued. It means the entire discourse within the state apparatus kind of orbits around hard power. And that's very, that's what's happened. That's North Korea today. Yeah. It's superpower scale. I mean, that's, and I, the, so this idea that the Soviet Union was bent on world domination in a very, in a, in a very concrete and, and brutal way. I believe that the United States has been on world domination too. But the United States had a way of subverting other societies other than, you know, we're going to level you and decimate you and genocide you. I mean, America would do that, too, if they had to. But that wasn't just like the option of first recourse. And I have no doubt, and Gorbachev in his memoirs made this point. If this, if the, about every decade, okay, 1953, 1962, 1973, 1983, the, the world came closer, very, very close to nuclear war. And each time, arguably, it was, like, even closer. Like, the Cold War had definitely continued. I mean, let's say it continued to, like, the late 90s, just even. And so, like, by 1995, 96, you know, nuclear weapons are basically all now in space, you know. And it's okay. Like, that was, like, a three-minute warning time. You know, basically, like, the Soviets, like, blink. It's like, okay, we got to destroy them. I mean, like, what would happen then in a crisis? You know, or, uh, like, it, 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 eventually it would have happened. I, that doesn't mean the world would have ended, but there would have been probably 40 million people dead or like 100 million people dead. And that would have changed everything, man. That would have changed life on Earth forever. Like not in like horror movie terms like the Terminator, but it, it, if like 100 million people died in nuclear war, like the world would never be the same. You know, and it, it's in ways we can't even imagine. You know, I mean, think about that. It, uh, so, I mean, one of the things, the so- one of the reasons the Soviet Union... <laughs> Even guys who I think believed, I I know this, even guys who believed in the system, they knew they had to find a way out of the Cold War. Like, they knew it. Because, again, this technology could not be controlled. And people think it's, and I'm not even saying people are dumb or something. They just don't have a comparative basis. People think that something like the Soviet Union of 1985, it's not like, you know, the office you work at, even a big company of, like, 50,000 people. Like, it's not something, like, any one man or 100 men or 1,000 men can just control. You know, it's like once once the apparatus gets in motion towards kind of a nuclear war vector, it, it, that's just what's going to happen. You know, and I mean, that was, that, that was what was happening. You know, it, this was not some paranoid fantasy or something. You know, I mean, so that's one of the reasons I guess I'm kind of, cons- I, I've got kind of a, I, I've got kind of a, like, like our guys on the right say I've got like a soft view of Bush 41. I mean, maybe I do. I don't know. But I, I mean, whatever. I, I don't care what people think about my takes on 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 chief executives of, of history but um there like what i described didn't happen okay and some of that we owe to people like bush okay uh yeah the cold war shouldn't have happened in the first place you know world war should not have happened but but it did happen so that's where we were at you got to judge things in their epoch so that's i realize that's an incomplete answer but that's the best i can do yeah that's no a great problem. question I- uh, thank you. Yeah, it's he. I just remember them selling. Oh, he's from Massachusetts, and they tried to connect him to be like the next Kennedy or something like that. It was just, it I mean, was really terrible. Swept. I mean, Bush, 
you know, God love Bush, but other than and Bush was actually a great commander in chief, and the way he he managed the Gulf War with with like 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 a like a Prussian officer of the highest caliber would. Okay, but other than that, I mean, Bush was not a man of the people, and I mean that's why he got smoked uh, in the three way race with Clinton and Perot. But I mean, the fact that Bush was able to sweep the country against Dukakis, it's like, look, man, it's like if you're getting if you're getting smoked by Bush, you know, it's like you got you're not a viable candidate. See, so yeah, Dukakis was a weird, like a guy like Greer, Scott Greer. He'd be a good guy to take that up with, because like he, I mean, he knows like electoral politics like the back of his hand. Like I really don't. I mean, I know the outcome, but it's, I don't have like deep takes on that stuff generally. But Dukakis was a weird. He was a weird nominee, man. He definitely was. He definitely was. Right. I think this is going to be a great first episode. Um, give your plugs, and we'll end it. Yeah. Thank you, Pete. Uh, the main place people should hit me up is uh, on my sub stack. It's real, real Thomas 777 at substack.com. Dot substack.com. Sorry. You can find me on Tgram, Telegram at t.me slash the number seven HMAS 777. I back on Twitter once again because Elon seems to not be laying the hammer down on people you know for the record man like i've never actually violated twitter t- in terms of service like, i'm not just saying like i never have you know but i've been banned like half a dozen times but you can find me there um at triskelion jihad uh the first t is the number seven um but i'll i'll post it's posted up on my sub stack and stuff so just go there um and i mean I, for all i know in like two days i won't be there anymore so it's and I am launching the damn YouTube channel. Please don't think I'm being a total flake. Uh, I just had a lot on my plate in terms of content and like other stuff. But I, it is moving forward. I got an announcement I think people will be happy about. I'm, I'm debating the JFK assassination in a few days with a guy that I got a lot of respect for. And he's actually a college professor of the right kind. He's, he's like a right-wing history guy. But he disagrees with me profoundly. So I think people will dig that. I'm going to do it on a live stream. So I'll, I'll hit people to that. And that's what I got. And Thank you very much, Pete. I really appreciate you hosting me. And I really I really appreciate right. people um watching and, and, and commenting and stuff. I really mean that I'm not just being polite. Well, I can't wait for until we go back to the beginning because that's where um the intrigue of that is. Oh yeah. No, it's really Yeah, yeah. No, I'm very excited, man. I'm I'm very, very I'm very stoked that you uh you had this uh, had this notion for us to do this series. So thank you very much again. All right. Thank you. Take care, Thomas.